Yeah, I'm really excited to follow these two other speakers because the stuff I'm gonna be talking about um, is really reminiscent of both of those, you know, some of the things we heard about in both of those talks in uh, as well as three. So, oops. Um, all right, so I'm gonna be talking about quasi-periodic prints from triply periodic blocks. So triply periodic solids and surfaces have become a staple of mathematical sculpture. Bathsheba Grossman's iconic gyroid sculpture down here is one of my favorite examples. The gyroid's a surface that divides space into two parts. We could make a solid model of it by filling one part with wood and leaving the other part empty. So in this sculpture, you could imagine that some of these channels would get filled with material or filled with wood, and then the other channels would remain empty. Um, uh -oh. All right, so take that wooden gyroid and imagine slicing it along some plane. Spread ink on the cut surface and press it against the page. Now you have a woodblock print. If the plane you cut along is irrational, in the sense that it can't be spanned by vectors with rational coordinates, then the print will be quasi-periodic. So echo itself regularly, but never quite repeat. So here's an example of what that would look like. Um, if you, so this sort of white solid is a model of the, the type of the model of the gyroid that I described earlier. So the white stuff is the wood and everything else is empty. And on the top here, I've cut it along some irrational plane. And I've uh, uh, colored that cut surface. You can imagine it's covered in ink. And you can see that there's this sort of weird wavy pattern um, on the inky, you know, on the inked surface. And if you were to press that against a page, take a lot, you know, take a larger sample of it, press it on a page, you would get something that looks like this. So this is a, um, these are some actual woodblock prints that I made at the ICERN Illustrating Mathematics program to imitate the results of that printing process. Now, sadly, I didn't actually have the tools to create, you know, a real block of material and cut it. So instead, I made each of these prints by laser etching a square of laser safe MDF, or in some cases, printmaking linoleum. And I etched it so that the surface of that uh, square would show the cut surface of the block in relief. So instead of taking the, you know, creating this entire sculpture of the gyroid, slicing it, and then printing from it, it's as though we sculpted only the very, very top part, only like this infinitesimal layer right before, right, right after the cut. So um, this is a, you know, a slice of the gyroid that um, we saw earlier. This is a slice of a different surface, which um, Olga Paris Ramoskovich suggested would be a good um, candidate for making these sorts of pictures for studying this sort of stuff. And here's a few more pictures of um, you know different different types of prints you can get. This is another slice of well, another print of the same slice of the gyroid. So during the program, there was a laser cutter outage. And so I bought a carving tool and started trying to make these uh, wood cuts by hand. And I, I am not a very <laughs> experienced wood cutter, so I wouldn't recommend this as an efficient way to produce these pictures, but it definitely has a different character. I should, I have to admit that if you look carefully at this picture, you notice that there's an error here because one downside of hand cutting is that 
it takes hours rather than minutes to make that cut, at least if you're as bad at it as I am, but still only seconds to make a mistake. So conversely, an advantage of making laser cut wood blocks is that you can iterate designs really rapidly. Um, it just takes a few minutes to make an adjustment, uh, cut a new, um, you know, cut a new block, and then you can start using it for printing the next day. So these patterns are really beautiful and striking, um, but I didn't start making them because of that. I started making them because Olga Paris Moscovich, the person I mentioned before, you know, brought them to the Eisen program, wanting to look at them because they show up in physics. Patterns like these help physicists understand how metals conduct electricity in strong magnetic fields. So when I first came to this area, I was fascinated by this I you know and I so I want to give you at least a short quick technical sketch of how that works because if you have the background to understand it it's a you know a really beautiful thing and it's something that I would have appreciated when I first came to the area that said then don't worry about following all the details um the talk will be rewarding enough later on and even if you can just keep the broad ideas in mind. And near the end of the talk, I'll show you some physics, um, a physics punchline that's not nearly as technical as all this, a much more accessible punchline. So if you zoom in on a piece of metal, you'll see that at small scales it's a crystal, a triply periodic arrangement of atoms. Being triply periodic means that you have a symmetry group generated by three translations, which are called T1 through T3. You can start learning how metals conduct electricity by studying how a single electron moves through a crystal. In quantum mechanics, every motion is described by a differential equation, um, linear differential equation involving a linear map, H. And symmetry is like those translations of a crystal, appear as linear maps that commute with H. Since those translations also commute with each other, we can simultaneously diagonalize this, um, we call it time, Sort of time generator H, and these, um, or let's say infinitesimal time translation H, and the spatial translations T1, T2, and T3. So the basic rules of quantum mechanics guarantee that when we do that simultaneously diagonalization, uh, we get eigenvalues that look like this. So H will have a real numbers and eigenvalue, and then the eigenvalues of T1, T2, and T3 are these unit norm complex numbers which you can describe by these angles, P1, P2, and P3. And those numbers, E, P1, P2, and P3, are the energy and momentum of the electron in the simultaneous eigenvector state, the state of motion described by that simultaneous eigenvector. So we started with a quantum mechanical model of a electron moving around in a crystal, like a crystal of metal. And we ended up with a linear algebra problem, problem of simultaneously diagonalizing a bunch of linear maps. And the simultaneous eigenvalues gives you um, the simultaneous eigenvalues defined of four numbers, which I uh, tell you about the energy and momentum of that. Now, not every value of energy and momentum can appear as solutions of this eigenvalue problem. So for every choice of operators, you'll get certain eigenvalues that occur, and you'll get certain, only certain eigenvalues that can occur together. And those allowed values of energy and momentum sweep out a region in energy momentum space, which is called the electron's dispersion relation. In physically sensible models, you can expect the dispersion relation to be a smooth submanifold of energy momentum space, well, maybe with a couple singularities. In fact, it's typically a branched cover of momentum space. And the sheets of the cover are called energy bands. 
since the eigenvalues that define um, P1, P2, and P3 lie on the unit circle, momentum space is a three-dimensional torus. And in this talk, from now on, all of the triply periodic solids we get from physics will come from the momentum space. So one sort of weird feature of the way this patterns show up in physics is that none of them are pictures of a material in normal position space. They're all pictures of the possible momentum values that an electron can have. Now, in a two-dimensional crystal, the electron momentum only has two components. So you can visualize the energy-momentum relationship as a surface in three-dimensional space. Here are some representative examples. So the simplest example is of a, one of the simplest examples of a crystal is just a square lattice. And if you graph this energy-momentum relation, you get this a sinusoid surface like this. So the function, you know, in this case, there's only one sheet in the covering. We have like a, just an ordinary covering of momentum space. And you can describe the surface as the graph of just like a product of cosine functions of the momentum. So energy equals cosine of x momentum times cosine of y momentum or something like that. For a slightly more sophisticated example, you can look at this, a, a honeycomb lattice. This is the type of lattice you'd see in a single layer of graphite. Now, here you get a more complicated dispersion relation. In this case, uh, the dispersion relation is a branched double covering of the energy moment of the, of the momentum space which means that for every possible value of momentum, there, uh, there is two possible energies. So you um, can look at it from sort of some different points of view. If you look at it from above, you'll see a sort of a nice lumpy surface. It looks like a, a little like a mattress topper or something like that. Uh, it's symmetric on the bottom. And then if you look at from the side, you'll see that these two sheets meet in these tiny points. Um, and those points have some are really special from a physics point of view, but I don't want to get into that today. All right, so when you start studying electrons moving in a surface, you find that their energy and momentum are related to each other. You know, with a given, typically with a given energy, there's some discrete set of momentum values. Sorry, typically with a given momentum, there's a discrete set of energy values which are, which are possible. And um, the relation between momentum and energy is called a dispersion relation. And because momentum space is periodic, the dispersion relation it's sort of like a periodic graph. It's a graph of a periodic multi-valued function in momentum space. So now in each energy band, you can see that the dispersion relation as a graph of a function, which gives an energy at each point in momentum space. Um, so for example, in the square lattice dispersion relation, because there's only one sheet, I already said it's, it's convenient to think of this thing as the graph of the function cosine of x momentum times cosine of y momentum. And okay. So um, if you choose a energy band, you get an energy function on momentum space. And in physics, when you have a material at like some fixed temperature, often you'll find that all of the energy states below a certain level will be occupied, will be filled with something, in this case, filled with electrons, and all of the ones above that level will be empty. So now moving from talking about a single electron, moving through a metal to many electrons, um, you can say, OK, have a piece of metal, a piece of copper or something at some temperature, room temperature. 
And there are many, you know, there are many possible um, momenta states that the electrons in it can have. Each electron sort of acts like an individual electron, roughly. And you'll find that below a certain energy level, which I've sort of described by making this cut here, all of those momentum states, like all of the momentum states below a certain energy level will tend to be occupied by electrons. And all of the states above the level will tend to be empty. So if you look down at this picture, looking down at momentum space, you'll see some regions of momentum in space which are full of electrons and other regions which are empty. And if you move that level up and down, the picture changes. And sometimes it can change in quite dramatic ways. And as an example here, at this high level of energy, this high energy cutoff, um, the part of momentum space that the electrons can access is all connected. There are just these little holes where the energy is too high and they don't want to go up there. But if you take a lower energy level, then the low energy regions are disconnected from each other. So the electrons you know, might want to stay in this region of momentum or that region, but they don't want to go in between them because then the energy would get too high and they're too rigid for that. They're too cold for that. Um, now, if you have multiple energy bands, then you can make the same story with the caveat that you have to choose which bands you're looking at. So here in this honeycomb lattice dispersion relation, we've got two different bands. And for each one, you can look at various low energy regions. So for a sort of energy near the bottom of the band, you'll have these disconnected regions. Notice that in this case, the low energy region is clustered really closely around these special points where the two bands touch each other. And at high energy levels, then you get um, these, uh, you know, sort of most everything being connected. All right. So in three dimensions, you can do pretty much the same thing. So if you have a three-dimensional crystal, let me go back. So if you have a three-dimensional crystal, you can you know, pick some energy band, and that gives you an energy function on momentum space, which is now this three-dimensional torus. And as you adjust the energy up and down, you'll get some solid, which describes the low energy region, the allowed momenta of electrons below that energy threshold given by the temperature. So you get some solid that maybe is like this. Now, you won't actually get this gyroid as a solid from that. Sort of from a physical picture like that. But I'll show you, I can show you some slices of things you can get. So, right, can everybody see? Oh, wait a minute. Okay. All right. Can everybody see a pattern of sort of white and green? Yes. Regions? Great. Okay. So this is an example of the, this is a slice of the low energy solid in momentum space that you would get for a particular metal. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this one is copper. 
Um, I can try to find that. You can just there. And right now we're sort of viewing it along a rational plane. So it looks sort of very nice and orderly. You can see that it's periodic. And then if you start moving that plane around, you'll see that it gets um, sort of you know, progressively weirder and weirder. Now, if you zoom out, you can see this quasi-periodicity of these patterns. You can see that um, the pattern looks like it's sort of all echoing itself. It's almost repeating itself over and over, but it's never quite repeating. So as an example, you know, along these sorts of tracks, maybe if I zoom in again, you can, uh oh, what was I going to do? Okay. Along these tracks, you can see, for example, these, there are these little boxes that seem to echo over and over again but they're changing shape as you go along and they're sort of merging with each other and emerging. And those, uh, those things, you know, that sort of pattern is typical of quasi-periodicity. Now, the reason that physicists are interested in drawing and studying and understanding pictures like this is that the visual features of this picture actually tell you something about the physics of the material that you're looking at. And you know, this is something that was discovered by some physicists named Moltsev and Novikov. So in the slice that I'm looking at, that we're looking at right now, you can see that the filled regions, the regions which are full of possible electron states, full of electrons, join up into these long stripes. They're all appear to be completely connected to each other. And it turns out in that case that electrons have a, a sort of an easy time moving through the material. Now, weirdly, they, they don't like to move in the direction of the stripes. When the magnetic field is strong, the stripe direction is, is not Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should say yes. This so when you have a magnetic field perpendicular to the slicing direction, then this picture tells you about the motion of the electrons. Turns out they don't like to go in the directions of the stripes, but they're very happy to go in either of the other directions. And on the other hand, if you fiddle around a bit with the um, with the angles you can eventually get into a state where maybe like this one, where it looks like you sort of get disconnected pieces. You can see little islands where the low energy region sort of is all connected to itself. So like electrons at low energy could go sort of all throughout this little bit. But those islands are disconnected. So if you wanted to get from this momentum to that momentum using only uh, you know, staying within the low energy region, you couldn't do it. In this case, the electrons are much more restricted in their travel. It turns out that they don't want to travel anywhere in this field, in this plane of the slicing, anywhere in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. They only want to travel in the magnetic field direction. So just even by looking at the visual features of these plots and noticing the subtle change where those disconnected pieces connect up into stripes, you can understand um, the conductivity along different directions of this metal when it's in a strong magnetic field. So at that point, I should. I think I'm out of time, so I should stop for questions. But I'm happy to say more about this, this sort of final, this ending punchline, because there's a little bit more to be said. <laughs>